Welcome to this next session on um, sustainability. And the theme is um, sustainability more than just a luxury. Um, I'm Ashley Bateson, a partner at Hawley, and uh, I chair the ACE uh, sector interest group on uh, sustainability. Um, I think we've got a fantastic panel of um, speakers here, and um, I think we're going to uh, have um, some interesting uh, inputs on, on perspectives for uh, sustainable development and um, diverse perspectives. Um, so on, on this theme, um, sustainability more than just a luxury, that's really to consider is, um, is, is concern for the environment and communities just something you think of when you've got some surplus money or is that, is that, uh, is that a challenge when money's tight? Uh, is it uh, an essential thing of every uh, property and infrastructure opportunity? So um, what I'll do is just, uh, just briefly go through our um, uh, panel profiles and then um, we'll, we'll, we'll let our um, speakers take the... Uh, the floor. So first of all, um, Mike um, Putnam is um, uh, co-chair of the Green Construction Board and also um, president and CEO of Skanska UK. Um, he trained as a, a civil engineer and um, as well as working with the Green Construction Board has a lot of um, UK construction experience. Um, uh, I read recently an interview where uh, Mike said he's he normally likes a direct and relaxed approach to work and doesn't normally wear ties unless he thinks he's going to uh, meet a client. So clearly Mike and I think we're going to meet clients today and, and the others know it's a room full of engineers. Um, so our next speaker will be uh, Rob uh, Pannell, who's Managing Director of um, Zero Carbon Hub. And um, the Zero Carbon Hub is a non-profit organisation that um, tries to seek... Um, clarity on um, uh, low and zero carbon development to meet the government's 2016 objective for homes and, um, and, and looks at uh, issues around the uh, performance gap. And, um, and then uh, John Kirkpatrick is head of uh, sustainability at Len Lease for the European Middle East and Africa region. And, uh, and interestingly, uh, this just shows the diversity of the people that get involved with sustainability. Uh, John studied um, zoology and then a PhD in um, ecological risk management, but I think that's a natural link to infrastructure and making sustainable projects. Um, and then um, uh, fourthly, we have Dr. Priti uh, Pirik, who's a lecturer and researcher at uh, University College London, and um, uh, Dr. Pr Pritty has also been at um, uh, uh, Imperial College and Cambridge University and has um, worked as a consulting engineer as well. So um, I think that's a, a, a broad background. So um, uh, what I'll do now is hand over to uh, Mike Putnam. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to give you uh, a few things about the work of the Green Construction Board. The board is very much a partnership between the public sector and the private sector coming together to try and help push the sustainability agenda forwards. Now you'll appreciate that the agenda is absolutely enormous, so it's impossible to, uh, you know, to get your arms around uh, everything, but it can provide a bit of focus. It's co-chaired by the Minister Michael Fallon and myself. We've been going for something like uh, just over two years, and we've just got a further remit for another two years, um, which is very much linked to the work of the industrial strategy, Construction 2025. So the board now is very much responsible for uh, progressing one of the uh, four key targets, and that key target is the greenhouse gas reduction of 50% by 2025 from the 1990 baseline. The work of the board has been captured recently by the Two Year On report that was produced in February, and it's available uh, to download from the uh, Green Construction Board website for those that haven't seen it. So just to focus on some of the key achievements, uh, last year, we produced the route map, uh, and this looks at 
the trajectory to 2050 with the 80% reduction target uh, that we have. And what that showed is that even on the most ambitious um, plans that are out that we know of today, uh, that the 80% target is just about possible, but it's extremely challenging. And based on what we know today, it would require us to uh, do things that are perhaps not sensible from a business case perspective. So that shows that much more needs to be done. But I think it's, what's helpful is it, it shows us the sorts of things that might need to be done in order to take us some way there. Going forwards, the board is focusing on the heating and lighting uh, aspects within the retail sector, which account for an enormous amount of greenhouse uh, gases. Across buildings, we've been looking at things like the performance gap. So the gap between the as-designed performance uh, from an energy perspective and the, uh, versus the performance in use. Going forward, it's about raising awareness and also trying to get some common baselines in, in terms of measurement. Just what do you measure and how do you measure it? We're looking to scale up retrofit, and I think as the economy emerges from recession and construction uh, uh, sector picks up, there will be much more focus on retrofit. And there's a lot of work being done, uh, actually, not just within the board, but uh, in various other bodies like UK Green Building Council and the European uh, equivalent, looking at the social and health impacts of green buildings. Not spoken about uh, very much. On the infrastructure side, there's two big outputs. The first is something we call the fundamental truths, which helps uh, all stakeholders to understand uh, where they might need to focus and to give them some help and some guidance, depending on where they are on the leadership curve, where they are on the cultural and maturity curve. And what going forwards, what we're looking to do is see if we can apply that wider than just the infrastructure sector to look across the whole uh, of the construction sector and across all the different stakeholders. And then there's the low carbon review, something that was published in November last year. And Treasury got behind this. And in fact, Treasury put their, their name to it. Um, it's supported by 20 organizations initially. And it's very much focusing on leadership, innovation, and procurement uh, in order to reduce uh, carbon. But the big message that came out of this report was that actually by focusing on lower carbon, it very much goes hand in hand with lower cost. Now, that isn't something that we tend to associate with the buildings side of things. But we've got a number of case histories that demonstrate that it's absolutely possible in the infrastructure uh, space. Now, going forwards, what we're looking to do is to develop some case studies and to garner wider support to this approach. Uh, so we're planning on having a conference uh, sometime in the autumn of this year. So just a few words to finish off. Uh, the Green Construction Board, as I've said, has got a further two-year remit. In fact, we're in the process of refreshing the board, and the new board meets uh, tomorrow. We're very much narrowing the focus uh, in order to focus on the 50% reduction by 2025. Uh, and finally, just to say that I believe, uh, and very much the Green Construction Board believes, that green represents a big growth opportunity uh, for the UK, but also a big growth opportunity for experts and uh, for uh, exports, sorry, and therefore consultants, many of you here in this room, have a big part to play in, in uh, both of those. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. It's great to hear the future's green. Lots of challenges and um, very ambitious carbon targets. Um, should also mention that Mike's on the uh, AC advisory board, so quite, quite close to the um, objectives of ACE. Um, next, um, uh, Rob Pennell from Zero Carbon Hub. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Good morning, everybody. 
Yes, I'm Rob Pannell. Uh, I look after the direction of the uh, Zero Carbon Hub, which was formed in 2008 because the government and industry got together and realised if the government was keen to deliver zero carbon buildings, zero carbon homes rather, from 2016, they ought to have a delivery vehicle to help achieve that. Um, I joined from industry. I was uh, 37 years with uh, a major construction company to become a house builder, Telewimpy, uh, before, before joining the hub. The, the, uh, the hub's requirement was it wanted a heavyweight from the industry. I'm not sure I complied with the weight limit, but uh, certainly tried to fulfil the task. But we're very much about delivering mass scale. Uh, zero carbon homes or low carbon homes as I prefer to call them. There's two areas in the title of our, of our, uh, uh, our business which is the first one is zero, we prefer low and we're not carbon, we're all greenhouse gases that affect the built environment. Um, actually, we, we actually work internationally. We, we didn't start off doing that. We started very much focusing on the UK's requirement for 2016. But more and more, I've been asked to speak in various uh, countries across the world talking about this subject. And it applies this issue about the uh, sustainability being more than just a luxury. Well, actually, it's a world problem. Carbon is a world problem. And we often forget that when you start looking inwardly, as we so often do in the UK. And we're trying to get across working with industry and with government to deliver zero carbon homes from 2016. Now, in terms of policy, do I think we're on target for that? Well, the hubs produces a report every quarter for government, and we present that report at a task force where the uh, meeting is chaired by normally the housing minister or more recently by the minister for building regulations, um, Stephen Williams. And uh, the last recent report has been showing the position as red. The next report we would produce is likely to show we haven't got any more, we can't go any more extreme than reds, we're calling it red critical because we don't think we're on target to meet this 2016 delivery program. However, there is still chance for another government to come in between now and 2016 that may make that delivery more possible. And we designed, or we're working with government, we designed the journey to be in three parts. We talk about a fabric first approach. And it doesn't matter what buildings you're involved in, whether it's uh, homes, schools, hospitals, or offices, we talk about more about the occupant's use than we do about the material uh, makeup of the building. So very much about fabric first approach, fit and forget. We're very much about when we come to the services, thinking about the services that are very much available to a mass scale rather than having um, unusual or wacky solutions, which we don't think would be commonplace. And then we have something called allowable solutions, which is where we can't resolve all of the carbon reduction on the building, on the development, where we allow for it to be dealt with on site if possible, but or near site or off site. And that is the least developed of all the, the, the policies at the moment from government and one that we're most worried about. But we also involve ourselves with unintended consequences. And Mike mentioned about the performance gap. So when you in your homes have a, a electricity bill or a gas bill, which you think is particularly high and you're worried about those increases affecting you and many others who have fuel poverty, uh, it's very concerning that actually the buildings we build today do not deliver what it says on the tin. And we've got evidence from the research that the hub's done, working with other universities as well, that shows some of the homes we've tested use up to 300% more energy than they were designed to use. That this is before anybody actually moves into the building to use it. Then we've got the occupant use, which is a whole other world of pain as well. And we're just completing a piece of work for government which is looking at this particular issue and we'll be launching that on the 8th of July uh, uh, by the Minister uh, for Building Regulations is launching his response to our report which should make very interesting listening. Anyone want, even want, wants to go to that, uh, there's some information on the reception uh, for you to take away. We're also interested not only in just the performance gap but other intended consequences which affect the, the whole issue about whether sustainability is just a luxury. Things like overheating. I don't know how many of you in the room have live in a house or a flat or a, actually work in an office where you actually overheat. Does anyone have a problem with overheating? You might do as you go forward as we get a rather nice summer we're all looking forward to. But associated with that, we also have the issue about indoor air quality. So as we tighten up the buildings to perform better 
in terms of their air tightness and other functions, we are seeing a de degre degrading of the internal, internal air quality, which is another issue which we must get right. So we're very keen to drive forward the policies which government and industry want, because we do want to build a society which is going to give us uh, a long-term future for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, but also that we want to make sure that there aren't any issues along the journey that we create as well. So I want to just conclude by saying the critical things we have to do in terms of the presentations we're making today is to make sure that we plan this journey carefully, we consider it, uh, very, very carefully, and we then enact those um, key issues that will drive sustainability to be at the forefront of all our businesses going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Uh, it's interesting to hear that a lot of buildings are using more energy than predicted, and, and that comfort conditions are another issue as well. So as well as making them more efficient, they have to be comfortable in dealing with the adaptation issue. Um, our next speaker is um, John... Uh, Kirkpatrick from uh, Len Lease. Thanks, Ashley. Good morning. <clears throat> okay, it'll probably come as absolutely no surprise to all of you that a head of sustainability is going to answer the question of is it a luxury or not? Yes, it absolutely is essential. It's far more than just a luxury. And I don't mean that just because I'm trying to get some job security here. I actually do generally believe that. And I think a lot of people also believe that. I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes just picking up why I think actually it's that essential, why it's that important. Uh, and sort of building on some of the conversations just already had in terms of looking at some of the bigger picture stuff, maybe thinking a little bit more around sort of the thought-provoking stuff. Um, for me, sustainability is it, it's more than carbon, it's more than biodiversity, it's more than water. It's actually, fundamentally, it's about people. It's about how these sorts of systems can actually come together and support human life. And actually, that's one of the big issues that people forget to talk about. And I think Rob put it excellently there, that it's not just talking about carbon, it starts to talk about indoor air quality and health and well-being and, and what's the impacts beyond the, the typical things we talk about. So I think the reality is we live on a sort of human-dominated planet. I don't think we really take that into account when we think about the extent of some of these problems. And this is really brought home for me, I think, in 2010. I think that was a, a, a fundamental year for sustainable development that kind of went through very quietly and without much fanfare. But essentially, that was a turning point for sustainable development. That was the first year that uh, we actually shifted in the terms of balance. We actually moved from a rural existence to an urban one. More than 50% of the world's population are now living in cities. That's a really scary statistic when you think about it. That's somewhere in the region of three and a half, nearly four billion people living in cities. It's even more scary when you actually factor that in that cities that these people are living in, doing what you're doing, sitting here right now, or standing, or working, playing, sleeping, whatever it is they're doing, cities take up 2% of the world's land mass. That's half the world's population crammed into a very small, tiny space. Those cities use two-thirds of the world's energy generation. They produce two-thirds of the carbon output. They use over 80% of uh, the world's resources including natural resources, in fact, it's quite scary. Nowadays, we're actually in a position where 25% of the world's rivers never actually make it to the sea. And on top of that, that urban living has resulted in over a, a 1 billion tonnes of waste produced annually, which is a really scary thought when you start adding all those things together. But in truth, if you're not careful, that's just going to get worse. By 2050, there's a, a, a prediction that 70% of people will live in urban spaces which is staggering when you think about where we are now. So we really have to start thinking about some of these things around how do we actually get to keep the same quality of life? How do we actually get to the same standards in those forthcoming years when we can barely do it now in terms of the build-up of regulation? And I think for me, this is the fundamental shift. It's not actually about doing less harm to the environment. It's about actually doing more good. Business as usual is not enough anymore. We actually have to start thinking less negatively and more positively in terms of how the buildings we build, the neighbourhoods we live in, the cities we actually design, let's be honest, we're all adding those things together to make cities, um, can actually be a more of a positive impact. Because cities and urban regeneration and urban living as a whole goes way beyond the borders we currently have where we actually live and sleep and work. And those impacts are huge. I think fundamentally, though, we're in a very interesting time. We're in a position where, whilst we do have significant impacts globally and we have some phenomenal impacts outside of urban life, 
we are possibly one of the first few generations that actually have the technology, the, uh, the ideas, the science, the engineering, uh, and the ability to actually make some of these differences. We have the concepts, we have the ideas, we just need some of the actual impetus to move that, be it regulation, be it change within industry. But if we don't do that, in a couple of years' time, we're going to be in an absolute world of trouble. So I think, really, for me, it's uh, the challenge and the opportunity, actually, is driving that mindset and changing it away from thinking about individual projects or small elements and recognizing how does that fit into a bigger system? How does that become part of something much larger than just the one project we're on? How can your project or how can your scheme or whatever it might be, whichever element you uh, have involvement in the construction industry, how can your involvement actually make that change? How can we be in a position of adding up every little action to actually make a positive statement? And I think that's the direction we need to move into. But it's a wholesale mindset change. And it's not just from people, me, who've already drunk the Kool-Aid and actually believe in it. It's actually persuading other people who don't believe it. And that's, I think, one of our fundamental challenges and potentially a great opportunity. So that's all I really want to say, and I'll, uh, I'll let you move on. Go from there. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that optimism. Um, linking up with sustainability being about the, the conditions that uh, um, pe people are going to live in, um, Priti's done um, a lot of uh, research work in, in, um, in, in India looking at the impact of um, infrastructure on, on living conditions. So I th think it'd be good to hear what um, Priti has to say about that. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think we ended on an optimistic note, so perhaps we should start on a pessimistic note here. So, <laughs> so I'm a chartered civil engineer. I've had the pleasure and privilege of working both in industry and academia. So in UK, I've worked with Arab and Bureau Hapold, predominantly on overseas projects. And in India and Africa, I have worked with low-income communities. And I believe we actually have a crisis, and I'll tell you why. We face a challenge in terms of high population growth. So we have high population growth, we have urbanization, we have rural to urban migration, and we have limited resources. And this, this is a challenge we currently face. Added to that is the fact that there's going to be high population growth or increases, predominantly in developing countries, but within that in very deprived neighborhood and areas. And the consumption will increase. We currently have, say if you take Mumbai with a population of 12 million, 50% of that population lives in low-income communities or slums. They under-consume. They do not consume enough to meet their basic need. So imagine the scenario where in 20, 30 years, the population is going to double there, the consumption is going to double or quadruple, and we do not have those resources. So the challenge that we face is how do we actually design cities which are inclusive and which are sustainable? And therefore, I would argue that sustainability is not a luxury. It is actually need and necessity for us if we want to develop cities which are inclusive. So we need to work with communities. We need to think of sustainable infrastructure. And we need to think of how we improve environmental conditions and housing stock. Now, I don't know if you followed the elections in India recently. But if you did, uh, there were 660 million voters. Um, make a guess as to how many tweets were um, or tweeted during the election, about 56 million tweets from January to April just about the Indian election. It's the biggest democracy in the world, right? And um, it's a big party. But the driver this time for the election was actually unemployment and infrastructure. Uh, so water, san uh, sanitation, and energy provision, which is where I believe that the engineering industry has a key role to play. And uh, I have, I've had the pleasure of working in slums, in low-income communities. So I've worked at an approach called slum networking, where you actually build and develop infrastructure within slums, working with local communities. But then you connect the slums and you connect infrastructure to provide solutions for the city. Um, this is actually necessary, because otherwise you get uh, kind of ghettos, you get cities which are very fragmented. And also the fact is a lot of cities in different parts of the world, say in India, for example, um, even the city level infrastructure is very weak or substandard. And uh, through those experiences, I decided to go to Cambridge and during my doctorate, I interviewed 700 slum dwellers. So I interviewed 500 houses in India and 200 in Africa. 
And through this process, I actually noted that the quickest or the most efficient way of tackling literacy, for example, is infrastructure. So I noted that literacy for young girls doubled by 30 to 60 percent in slums just through engineering solution, very simple solution, water, sanitation, energy provision. Similarly, there was a reduction in infant mortality and incomes in slums doubled in five years, which is a remarkable achievement. Similarly, I asked 700 families what their priorities and needs were, and they said, forget governance, we need water and sanitation. So we need sustainable infrastructure, we need consultation, we need solutions which are embedded. And uh, what shocked me or surprised me this was an unexpected founding that actually after the provision of infrastructure, after working with local communities, after investing in land tenure, after developing the appropriate local kind of policy framework, we found that uh, the slum dwellers started investing in improving their housing stock. So there was this natural process of urban regeneration. And over a period of 10 years, surprisingly, the slum dwellers invested about 2,000 pounds which sounds like a small amount, but in that context and with the income they have, that is actually a huge amount, a huge amount of investment. So by initially investing 100 pounds per family in infrastructure, uh, it generated 2,000 pounds of investment. So there's a multiplier of 20 times. This is to demonstrate that if you uh, provide sustainable, inclusive infrastructure, uh, you can result, uh, it can result in regeneration. So perhaps there are lessons we can learn from the process, because I believe some of the challenges are extremely relevant in different parts of the world. Uh, we need to think of sustainable cities, we need to think of inclusive solutions, where we will work with local communities, and we need to think of sustainable infrastructure. If you look at urbanization, I believe by 2050, 85% of uh, the developed part of the world will be urbanized and 65% of the developing country will be urban. Hence, we need to think of sustainable infrastructure and inclusive solutions. Uh, and, if, uh, and I think London actually provides an ex exemplar case study if you look at the transportation system we have and also the public health movement and investments we have in infrastructure. Also, we tend to forget about the people. Infra um, in engineering and infrastructure is not just about the product, it is a process. So typically in UK, you would have a young British couple or a professional buying an apartment, moving up to a house, and then extending a house, renovating, scaling up, and then perhaps later on in life, scaling down. So housing is um, not a product, it is actually a process, and sometimes we tend to forget about that. And hence, our design processes need to be flexible and need to be inclusive. Also, uh, land ownership and financing mechanism is a key. And this may seem very straightforward in the context we are here today, but there are parts of the world where if you take Bombay and 50% of the population in slums, uh, they do not have a legal or clear land status, which means they cannot approach a high street bank to borrow resources. So you can imagine how this could be a barrier to investment in infrastructure. And I come from the land of Gandhi, so for me, the principles I've always embedded is about frugality and simplicity. How can we make designs very simple so that they can be adapted? Rather than over-engineering and over-designing our houses to a standard which may be really high and unrealistic. So how can we provide the basic and then facilitate communities to upgrade? And how can we shift aspirations? Right? So with the slums, you saw that um, they started off with infrastructure provision, and over 10 years, they upgraded the housing stock, literacy improved. So there's a shift in aspiration from basic needs and living, surviving, to actually improving quality of life. So how can we actually achieve this shift of aspiration in, say, London? There are parts of London, actually, where housing conditions are really poor, where environmental conditions are really poor. So how, how can we shift aspiration through engineering, rather than trying to over-engineer and build? So I'm going to leave you with this question, and I'm also going to reiterate, therefore, that sustainability is not a luxury, but I think it is a necessity for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Priti. Um, even though you've shocked us about the uh, conditions in some, some other places in the world, uh, th there's an optimistic note there about the multiplier effect of investment in infrastructure and how um, infrastructure uh, encourages people to invest in their own conditions and, and improvements. Diverse uh, 
but probably common optimisms on, uh, on, on sustainable development. Um, we have about um, 15, 20 minutes for any questions. Farah Naz from Ramble. My question is for Rob. Um, recently, the definition of zero carbon just got revised to nearly zero carbon, um, uh, which I think in 8th of July we will know more about it. But my question was, how do you see this um, impacting the growth of City of London and meeting our carbon targets and energy targets and driving the energy infrastructure? Thank you. I think the, uh, the concern I have is that in 2011, in the budget, the, the government wound back its target from including regulated and unregulated energy, uh, energy in the, um, the definition. Uh, therefore, true zero carbon changed at that point, and I think that was a shame that we diluted our ambition. And I'm just worried that we'll continue to dilute, dilute our ambition as we find it more uneconomical or more of a challenge commercially to actually do it. So if you think that take a typical building cost for a home, 1,000 square foot, sorry, I'm still in old English, uh, would cost, say, £100,000 for simplicity. The original zero carbon definition would have added £40,000 cost, build cost, <coughs> to that, which was, for any industry, was unpalatable. So the government listened to that and, and wound back that definition. Um, and I think as we move forward to the final lap of 2016, I, I'm expecting it to be softened again because I don't think the government is in a position to per, per, um, add additional cost to the industry when it's just trying to recover from recession. I think my personal view, and it's not necessarily a hub view, is that the, uh, the government's going to, this government, is probably going to focus more on the nearly zero energy buildings target from Europe for 2020 rather than focusing on, on the ambition for 2016. But we'll, we'll see. This government still, every bad budget, it's interesting, isn't it? The budget last year said we are committed to 2016. This budget, I was with the minister at the time on the day of the budget. He said, oh, look, Rob, here's the red book and here it is. We are committed to 2016. Was there any doubt? I asked the question. Why do you need to keep reiterating it unless there was doubt? So I do have a concern. I do hope that this government does see through on its... Uh, it's pledged to carry on from the last government, a 2016 development policy. So in terms of London and your question, um, I think we'll get there. I just don't think we'll make the time scale as originally set out um, some years ago now. Just, just picking up on that cost theme, because that's a capital cost issue, and, um, and might Im implied that uh, sustainable buildings don't necessarily have to cost more. Is what, 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 What's the panel's view on um, uh, whether um, the capital cost increase is necessary if you, if you make um, a building uh, have reduced environmental impact, such as through energy efficiency or water efficiency. Is, yeah. When you look at the, um, the infrastructure side uh, with the low carbon review, there are some clients that are, that are achieving a 50% reduction in carbon at the capex level today and 20% reduction in the opex uh, phase. So you absolutely need to look at things on a whole life cost basis. Do you think the Scandinavians have a different view to looking at operational and capex no, issues? I don't, I don't think they have a different view. I just mm. think uh, that they're naturally further ahead than we typically are uh, here. It's very much part of their mindset. Uh, John Twitchin from Copper. Um, I wrote an article on this subject. I'm very pleased to have heard the, the, the comments there from the panel. I wrote an article for Infrastructure Intelligence uh, about a month ago on exactly this subject. And um, I think, you know, we've been involved in many schemes, many bids, many projects, and there's some really good stuff happening. Really, really good stuff. Um, when it's embedded, my concern is that too often, and the term value engineering was mentioned in the previous session, too often the red pen flicks very quickly to the, the green bits, the nice bits, and you know, they're fundamental, they're absolutely fundamental. The last point about whole life costs, operational costs, what you do at the end of that building's life, when that might be, 
those are all critical facets. So it would seem to me, we may well be, let's assume we're 100% committed. Everyone in this room gets it. They may have drunk the, the Kool-Aid, I like that, I quite like that. Um, but they, they get it. But how is, it, how is this embedded and cascaded? And what, what's, the, what's the training behind this inside these, some of these large organizations that are represented up on the, on, on the panel uh, right now? Thanks very much. John or Priti, do you, do you want to say something about that? Um, I, <coughs> I, th I think I actually have to agree with Mike. It comes down to leadership, and it relies on that requirement within that business. Now, I'm quite lucky. I, I work in a company that actually takes it that seriously to the point of um, I actually sit on the regional investment committee. We don't invest money on projects unless we get a number of sign-offs throughout the whole scheme, uh, me being one of them. So if, if I decide that a project isn't sustainable enough or couldn't have the potential to be sustainable, we actually have a vote in whether we actually do that or not. And that's, that starts at the top, but it goes all the way down, all the way down to the, the project director, the project managers, the guys actually out on site as well. And for us, it's embedded in the briefs, and I'm, I'm not going to argue it's, it's not easy. It really isn't. You do need to keep stepping on people and making sure that actually they're doing what they were told to do to start with, but it's got to be embedded throughout the whole process, and it's actually got to be from the top down in terms of leadership. And then you've got to keep checking and checking and checking. And I think that's unfortunately that's where we are at the moment. And I think the reality is, even though everyone is 100% committed, as you say, in some cases, things slip, things disappear, things get value engineered out. You need some champions to make sure that's got to stay in. Or, you know, that actually, for me, comes from leadership. That project director's got to step up and say, well, I know we need to save some money, but let's try and find little bits from here and there, not so take something wholesale. So I think there is that issue in terms of how do you embed it, but actually requires that leadership requirement all the way through. Thanks. Um, Pretty, do you, for, do you find um, when, when you see those improvements in India that that's come from a local leadership that, that a decision has been made or, or is, it, is it done through um, a, a, a different procurement approach? Uh, how, how important is leadership in sending that signal that you have to um, ensure this project happens? Uh, in India, leadership is important and the timing. So if you approach a leader immediately after elections with four years to go, uh, that's the optimum time. And that's something we've had to learn the hard way through our experience where we would approach someone six months before election and they would be busy preparing for campaigning. Uh, considering in mind India is such a huge country that campaigning takes six to eight months very easily. Um, so the timing is actually critical as well. It's not just leadership. Uh, but also thinking about uh, systems, so a, a bit of systems thinking approach really helps. So water supply systems are systems and people forget that they relate to actors. So people at the end of the water supply system open the taps. Uh, so what I do is I actually in UCL, I run a module on system society and sustainability where I have 60 odd students in my class, all engineers, and we spend 20 hours actually discussing a more systematic approach social technical systems, actor network theories, um, also looking at the role of engineer. Uh, there's this tension between, uh, there's this perceived tension between meeting the needs of client, looking at the financial constraints, looking at environmental constraints, sustainability, um, and I see the role of engineer as an honest broker with constant negotiation and communication between all parties. Matthew Farrow, uh, Director of the Environmental Industries Commission, which is a trade body for the environmental technology and services sector. A uh, question for the panel is, environment has slipped down the UK political agenda in recent years. Um, I can't really see any of the political parties this time promising to be the greenest government ever in the way the coalition did when they came into power four years ago. So the question is, does that matter uh, in terms of the practical impact on the ground? And if so, what can we collectively do about it? Although I represent the Green Construction Board, I do not uh, speak on behalf of uh, government. I mean, I think uh, political leadership helps a lot. But what I see is a lot of um, other stakeholders uh, really pushing this agenda quite fast. I also think there's quite a few things that are going on within government that many of us aren't aware of. Uh, so, for example, DEC have just uh, carried out yet another green retrofit of their office in, here in uh, central London. And that wasn't just a one-off intervention. They've had several interventions that have taken them further up the, uh, up the curve. Um, and, you know, it's not publicised. So one of the things um, 
I was talking about the other day as part of the board was actually we need to make sure that these things are publicised so that uh, we can all see that actually, uh, irrespective of what you hear at headline level politically, that departments are taking this agenda seriously, just like many other uh, you know, parts of the private sector, and pushing the, uh, the agenda ahead. Rob, do you find with the stakeholders in the Zero Carbon Hub, because that represents a, a lot of people working in the construction industry, that irrespective of the policy um, statements, that there's still this momentum to go towards more efficient buildings anyway? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm certain that industry actually wants to produce a better product for its client or its, for its end user. Um, and as long as that is in a commercial uh, basis, then I, I think that that's a driver. Let me just give you one example. I, I, because we work on some things internationally, which is always gives us an interesting twist and in hearing from Pretty earlier as well. Um, just had an email from Singapore this morning um, asking about what information we had on plug loads because they're looking more at what's gonna happen in terms of green leases. And I can see a benefit for the, for the, the end user here. We, this, is why the this is why the performance gap's so important, that we understand that the end user wants lower energy bills. They don't want these continually rising energy bills in their business. So if we can create buildings that actually have low energy bills, then that's a win for the industry, the construction industry, the, 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 the whole sector, but it's also a win for the, for the end user as well. So if we can tie this in with a benefit for the construction industry and a benefit for the, uh, the end user, then we've got a win-win situation. Mike and Rob mentioned the performance gap. And if we're trying to achieve these targets, the performance back in, gap in my mind might drag us back. Um, there might be a number of reasons for that, technological, behavioral, complexity, don't know, uh, probably all of those. I, I wouldn't mind a couple of views on that just because as consultants and engineers, are we in this chain and should we be doing something about it? I think, uh, first off, we, need, we do need to raise awareness of this issue because I think many people believe naively that if something is designed to a certain level, it will perform at that level. Um, so we need to raise awareness. We need to um, uh, help develop the whole piece around measurement um, so that we're measuring on a consistent basis and understanding that when we're measuring one thing in one place and another somewhere else, that there is some... Um, uh, opportunity to compare and contrast between them. And then actually when you look behind the whole issue, it's not just about design and performance of components within design, but it's also about the way, uh, that, uh, the way that a particular building is constructed uh, some, and some inefficiencies that come in at that point. And then of course it's about how the building is used. Uh, so there's, there's many different facets uh, to this. Um, but I think raising awareness and having a sharper focus on it uh, will, uh, will help. I mean, I mentioned the deck one uh, example a few moments ago. Interestingly, that one is performing better than, uh, than designed already. Interestingly, we, we, because we tend to do everything across the value um, supply chain and value property chain, we, we do everything from design, um, build, yeah, actually manage and so on, So I mean, own those properties. So in some cases, we will do that. Um, but it's an area, particularly in homes, that we're starting to look into. I mean, traditionally, construction industry actually builds these homes, sells them on, and never ever goes backwards to check on them. Um, and Rob and I have actually had these conversations around the, the as-designed, as-built gap, which is huge. Um, so I'm, I'm with Rob on this one. I'm generally worried that even if we do set another target in a couple of years' time, it's kind of irrelevant because we're not even meeting the targets we've set now. So it's almost two steps from that perspective. Um, picking up your point in terms of what can engineers do, I think, I think we're actually asking the wrong questions or engineers are asking the wrong questions. When we go in and say, what does your brief say? What do you want us to build is, is one question and that's normally where we start. But actually it's beyond that. It's, okay, what do you want this building to do? How are you gonna run this building? Let me design a building for you based on what you want it to achieve. And I think we're not going far enough in asking those questions. Even to the point of some of the uh, office refits we've just done, we've actually got the design team before we even set the brief, just to actually sit in the office and work out of that office for two weeks and see how a client utilizes the space. Because what a client says they want and what they actually want are very, very rarely the same thing. So actually finding that 
gap and actually getting the engineers to design in that way or even approach in that way, I think is, is a step beyond where we are now and I think that's vital. So engineers need to find out more what the client wants from the building. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. One of the biggest roles an engineer can have, I think, mm. is educating a client to actually tell them what mm. they really want. Yeah. Thanks. And um, the last question here. Thank oh, yeah, thanks, Steve Fox. A um, couple of questions or a couple of takes on things. I think, uh, John, I think obviously we sit here in our rather privileged position. Uh, I guess most people in this room get the breadth of the word sustainability. Um, but of course, when you step outside here, it's a bit different. And I wonder whether actually one of the problems we're encountering is just that. You start to dilute the effect by broadening what it's about. So two things I'd be interested in, in the panel's viewing. One is actually, what's the low-hanging fruit? What should we actually go out and concentrate on doing to make a difference? And should we be thinking here in our own society, or I'd say it's our duty to actually concentrate far more on the global picture, because this is a global problem. We're a tiny, tiny part of the globe. I'm actually on a one-man campaign in my business to ban the word sustainability. I know that sounds a little bit odd, but it's true. I think you start with that word, and everybody just puts it in a box, and they just accept, oh, you're you know, talking about being green, or you talk about... It automatically judges you on what you want to do. And my CEO actually had a conversation with me the other day, and he said, um, yeah, I, I don't use the word sustainability, because for me, it's, it's interchangeable with the word innovation. It's just keeping going. It's how do we move forward? And if we as a business are going to be sustainable going forward, we've got to be innovative, we've got to be cutting into all the usual CEO lines. But the reality is exactly that. And we've got to move away from the conversation about the S word, as we're actually calling it in the office, um, because literally we get caught up in that trap of having the same discussions on over and over again, where in reality we just need to get down to the, the brass tacks and start designing stuff. So I think that, that's the crucial element. But yeah, I think you're exactly right. We need to think about how do we actually design buildings, projects, you know, neighbourhood levels, whatever it might be, to be slightly more positive and actually doing more than they were actually designed to do because they are part of a much bigger picture and they need to address some of these global issues. Thanks. And maybe just to finish with Pretty on that question about are we trying to deal with too many things at once, do you think, from your research, keeping things simple, I think that was something that you found was, was important? Uh, yes, I did, especially in the global context where the problem or challenge is the provision of services, the provision of good housing stock, uh, developing good transportation systems which are secure and safe for women. So if you put those agendas or issues together, uh, for me, sustainable development is about a process which is inclusive, good quality design, delivery, monitoring, health and safety, uh, it is, uh, so those principles, I believe, of simplicity, frugality should be Im embedded within the firm. It should not be boxed out. I think I agree with, I agree with what John was highlighting, that it is not a tick mark or it's not a box. Um, my father, actually, who is also a civil engineer, uh, actually tried to apply BRIAM, for example, in India, and he found that it was irrelevant for the, some of the work he was doing in Kutch, where some are 46 degrees. So... It's also about kind of localized standards, appropriate technology, but they should be embedded rather than having the word sustainability as a separate tick mark or a box. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, so maybe next time this is innovation more than just a luxury. Um, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll evolve from the S word. So uh, some, I think some of the key messages I've taken from this are the importance of leadership at the top in making sure things aren't value engineered, the importance of um, engineers um, uh, understanding what the client wants from, from a building, uh, discussing the brief, um, and, um, and the issue of the performance gap. If we are delivering projects that, when you measure them, aren't um, um, operating or using the amount of energy you thought they were, then what, what's going on with those design things? So... The, um, um, Opportunities there and um, great challenge. So, um, I'd like to uh, thank the panel. So, um, in, in the usual way, if we could thank our speakers for coming today. <laughs>